Hello everyone. Let's ask ourselves, how do visual illusions work? So let's just start with a typical visual illusion. So here's one. So it's a photograph that it looks like the weird color filter that was applied to it, right? There's a car in the middle of the photograph. It's an iconic British car that's blue, right? Well, of course, let's blow it up a little bit. Let's see what it really looks like. Let's blow it up some more. Let's blow it up some more. Let's blow it up some more. And now, maybe you can see that it's not blue anymore, right? Was it a mistake that your brain just made? Uh, uh, was, it a, was it a bad mistake? Uh, do you regret having perceived it as blue earlier? So, to answer this question, let's just take a little step back and ask ourselves, what is the general problem um, that your brain has in trying to perceive color? So, uh, very schematically, light, uh, there's light, it bounces off surfaces of objects, and then it reaches our eyes, okay? That's how we see things. Um, now, the color that reaches our eyes is something like a product. It's not really a product, but we can think of it as a product of the color of the light and something called the reflectance of, a sur of the surface that it bounced off of. Okay? Generally, you don't care about the color of the light, but the reflectance of a surface is actually what we call the color of an object. Let me give you concrete examples. Let's say there's red light that reaches your eye. So this could happen because there's white light that bounces off a red surface, and then red light reaches your eye. But it could also happen because you can hardly see, you can hardly see this picture. It's a, it's a person... Uh, kneeling next to a lamp, a red lamp. But so it could also happen that there's red light that bounces off a white or some other light-colored surface, and then red light will also reach your eye. So it's actually an ambiguous situation. So if red light reaches your eye, is it because you're looking at a red object in white illumination, or you're looking at a white object in red illumination? Or, as you can imagine, there are many other uh, possible combinations. Uh, let me give you another example with dark and light. So a bright surface under dark light will s send the same energy of light to your eye as a bright surface under dark light. And you can see this very clearly here with these two tiles. So you, 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 you're, probably your first perception is that this is a black tile and this is a white tile but they're actually the same shade of gray in this image. I don't know if I can convince you of it, but if you connect them, they're actually the same shade of gray. If you, if you cut them out and you, you superimpose one on top of another, they're the same shade of gray in this image. There's this example, which I think is better known. Maybe some of you have seen this one before, right? So uh, there's this nice checkerboard here. There's a, there's a cylinder that gives off a very vague shadow. You see, there's a very vague shadow. It's even hard to see, right? But it turns out that this little patch here uh, is the same shade of gray in the image as this patch here. That's hard to believe because you perceive this one as dark and you perceive this one as light. But once again, if you superimpose them uh, one on top of the other, you would see that it's the same shade of gray in the image. So this is your brain taking a very ambiguous situation, right? You have no idea what, you know, all you know is how much light is reaching your eye. And a priori, you don't really know uh, the color of all of these surfaces. This is the problem that your brain is solving. And this is your brain at work trying very hard to solve this problem. And uh, so, so one strategy uh, and I'm going to describe this in a very general way, is to perceive color and brightness by uh, comparing uh, an object to, to its nearby spatial environment. So, in other words, you perceive stuff relative to other stuff. Okay? You perceive the brightness of this patch here relative to the dark, relative to, to, the, to the dark area here and you perceive, and that's why, and because it's brighter than the dark area around here, you perceive it as white. 
and you perceive this also relative to its environment. And because it's darker than its environment, you perceive it as dark. It's actually a lot more complicated than that. Uh, but that's sort of the general idea. And you can see how it's more complicated than that because, well, uh, you, actually, you can actually demonstrate from things like this that there's a more complicated analysis that takes into account the geometry of shadows. And finally, our blue car that isn't really blue, um, blue and yellow are in a certain sense, in, at least in, in a part of your visual system, opposites. So gray, this is actually gray in the image, as compared to the yellow, you perceive the contrasting color to yellow is blue. But this is actually a very intelligent thing to do because this allows us to recover what, what are good guesses for the colors of objects in this very ambiguous situation. So it's probably a good bet that this is, this is brighter than this and that this is brighter than this. Let me show you another. So here are two patches of light. They're oscillating in phase. So one is bright, the other one is bright. When one is dark, the other one is dark. Right? I'm just going to make a very, very small manipulation. I'm not going to change at all the oscillation of the patches. I'm just going to add little borders, just little borders to the patches. That's all I'm going to do. They're still oscillating in phase, okay? But you actually perceive them completely out of phase, right? And that's because, uh, that's because when one is becoming brighter, it's, it's, it's uh, going farther away from the color of this little, little border. And when, and when this one is becoming brighter, it's getting closer to the color of the little border. So you're actually just perceiving the relationship between the brightness of the patches and the border. So if I remove the borders, you, you perceive the actual brightness. But as soon as I add the borders, as soon as I add like a little reference, just tiny, tiny rings, you, you, perceive, you perceive with respect to those things. So, so the same kind of thing, so I'm maybe stretching it a little bit, the analogy. But the same thing applies not only across space, neighbors uh, in space, but also neighbors in time. You perceive things relative to, to things that you, that you saw just a little while ago. So, so here's an example. This is a nice example of this, uh, of this effect. I don't know if you guys know this illusion. Okay, so it's really important to fixate the cross. Please don't look anywhere other than the cross. It's really tempting to look at the faces directly. Don't look at the faces directly. Please just look at the cross. Okay, do you see something weird? Does anyone see anything weird? Okay, do you see these weird caricature, caricatures? Okay. It's a, it, and if you, and as soon, okay, if you cheat, if you look at, if you look at directly at one of the faces, if you look at one of the faces directly, you will see that it's, it's actually a famous person and, and, and not a caricature. Uh, some of them are kind of weird, even without being a caricature. But uh, these weird effects, it's not completely clear. But they're thought to be due to, to the sequential nature. Uh, you're comparing the features of the current face to the features of the previous face. If the eyes are a little bit bigger, then you perceive them as a lot bigger. That's, that's, where, the, that's where the caricature effect comes from. Same thing for shape. So here's a door, okay? Uh, uh, you, you're, you're often interested in perceiving the shape, the real shape of an object. So here's an, here's an object whose shape remains constant, but you see it, uh, the, the projection of it, uh, the light that falls onto your eye is different for this, these different orientations, right? That's, that's really simple, right? Um, so, uh, but your brain also has to extract the shape of objects and has to ignore their configuration or vice versa sometimes. So there's this famous illusion. Have, have, has anyone here seen this before? A few people, okay. People find it hard to believe that these tabletops are the same shape on the image. That's what was really weird about this illusion, right? So the only way, if you haven't seen it, the only way I can convince you is by cutting them out. Yep. So, when you take them together, they're actually the same shape, right? So, why, why do they appear to have such vastly different shapes? It's, uh, I, would have, I would have liked to have uh, invented the solution, but it's not me. It's a, it's a famous uh, American psychologist, Roger Shepard. So, what's going on? Your brain is trying really, really hard to reconstruct the actual shape uh, uh, of these objects, and it's using rules that are too complex for me to get into right now. 
but the, the difference uh, 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 the different shapes that you perceive, uh, f uh, the different three-dimensional shapes that you perceive from the same two-dimensional shape is a sign of the work that your brain is doing to interpret two-dimensional images as three-dimensional objects. Generally, what we call illusions, or the kind of illusions that are sort of seen in, in the popular literature, the ones that I've just shown you now, aren't really bugs. Sometimes they're presented as bugs or something like that, or something that's not working, or mistakes or something like that. There aren't. They aren't. It's, it's, it's actually our brain trying to make sense of a complex world, uh, trying to apply uh, actually fairly uh, high performance algorithms to this ambiguous data, trying to, doing its best to extract uh, information about what we're seeing. And in experimental psychology, I'm an experimental psychologist, we, we sort of understand how, these, how these, these underlying operations work almost always, but not 100% of the time, there are, also, there are also weird things that look, like, that look like maybe they're bugs. And I would like to show you one. Uh, I would like to show you one because it's, it's one that I found myself, so I'm very proud of it. So this is maybe a bug. Maybe you were hoping that there are some bugs. And so this is, this, uh, this is maybe one. This is a ring. So probably what most of you perceive is a ring that's slowly rotating clockwise. And these slow clockwise rotations are punctuated by fast counterclockwise jumps. Is that what you perceive? And, and if we go the other way, if, we, if, the, if the slow rotations are counterclockwise, then the jumps uh, probably look like they're clockwise, right? OK, so, but the weird thing is that there, there are no jumps. The jumps are just in your head. Um, so if, if I go to slow mode, if I, if I slow down, what's, what's happening? is, is uh, so I start with this what's called a random texture. Uh, I, I turn it, the, that's a slow motion that you perceive. And then I just replace it uh, two or three times by, by, by some other random texture. Uh, there's absolutely no reason for your brain to perceive these jumps, but it does. Um, and we think it's, uh, the, well, uh, we're starting to have some ideas of what it might be, but it's, it's mysterious. It may be a bug. It may be a, a deep sign of something that's going on in, in, in the way that we perceive motion. We don't know yet. So, so just, to, just to conclude, so, so, so most solutions, we understand. We understand them. We understand why you get them. They make sense. And then sometimes you find something like this that, that, that doesn't make much sense, but maybe will at a later date. That's it, thank you.